Hello, this is Dr. Michael Hart, and uh, this is our second lecture um, on um, world geography, and this lecture is specifically on geopolitics. So what is geopolitics? In the broadest sense of the term today, it's a relationship between geography and politics. One possible way to understand geopolitics is to break it down into two distinct periods, pre-World War II period and post-World War II period. Geopolitics remains important today and continues to be shaped by new technological developments, such as space exploration, high-altitude reconnaissance, spread of the internet and social media, population migrations, and collapse of birth rates in economically developed countries. Carl Ritter was a German geographer who viewed countries as organic entities with temporary borders. World maps were inherently dynamic and would change with time. Ritter represented one of the earliest attempts at conceptualizing geopolitics. Following on his work, Friedrich Ratzel, who lived between 1844 and 1904 and was you know, heavily influenced by Ritter and Charles Darwin, Ratzel came up with the idea that countries were organic entities. You can see the emphasis on organicity here is Darwin's influence. And he said that countries could be healthy or unhealthy. Healthy countries, according to Ratzel, were expanding. That is, their territories were growing. Countries that were not expanding their territories were in decline. So for healthy countries that were in fact growing, there was a need for Lebensraum, uh, which is uh, living space in German. That was Ratzel's key idea. So healthy countries need more living space. It's uh, interesting to point out that Ratzel's lifetime uh, matches almost exactly that of Friedrich Nietzsche who was also heavily influenced by Charles Darwin. So you can see the influence of one particular <clears throat> scientist here come through in uh, the work of, of these two philosophers, Nietzsche being a pure philosopher and Friedrich Ratzel being really philosopher of geographic developments. And uh, just by uh, looking at what Ratzel was proposing, you can see uh, that this is uh, very much a proto or a crypto Nazi idea of the spread uh, of geographical spread of countries, justification for aggression uh, against uh, neighboring countries, because after all, expansion, aggression, they're all signs of health, signs of countries simply using their health to acquire more space. Now, Rudolf Jelen, who lived between 1864 and 1922, Jelen was a Swedish, Swedish political scientist and politician also, who first coined the term geopolitics. Jelen was a student of Ratzel and elaborated his organic state theory, Ratzel's idea that countries were living organisms. So Jelen's ideas were presented in his book, The State as a Living Form, published during the First World War in 1916. Jelen emphasized the need for a comprehensive picture that combined the living space, Lebensraum, with the strategic uh, military shape of the country. He also racialized countries, emphasizing that they had different folk, different racial composition. He also called for autarky, that is to say economic self-sufficiency, uh, he also emphasized the need for effective and efficient bureaucracy, in particular, um, a system of impersonal relations uh, in, in general. Uh, finally, bureaucracy and the military had to be ready to pacify and coordinate the people. So here in Jelen, we see not just the continuation of Ratzel's idea of external expansion, external aggression, but also the idea that this aggression has to have a domestic foundation, uh, that the government has to, in fact, be uh, very authoritarian, if not totalitarian, uh, 
exercising nearly total control over the population and standing ready uh, to use military force to pacify the people and to coordinate them. That is to say, to force them to work in a certain direction to fulfill the goals of this organic or organic state. Heartland theory by Halford Mackinder. Mackinder, uh, who lived between 1861 and 1947, was a British political geographer. Mackinder argued for the supremacy of land power over sea power. Mackinder asserted that the world was divided into camps, the rising Eurasian heartland and the subordinate maritime lands and other continents. He thought this because he noticed that most people in the world at the time lived in Eurasia and Africa. Also, this area contained vast natural resources. Heartland is also known as the geopolitical pivot of history. Who rules East Europe commands the heartland. Who rules the heartland commands the world island. Who rules the world island commands the world. So Mackinder has this deductive chain of reasoning whereby he thinks that if a particular country dominates East Europe, it will dominate all of Eurasia. And if it dominates all of Eurasia, it will dominate Eurasia and Africa. And if it dominates Eurasia and Africa, it will dominate the whole world. So this is a kind of interesting way to organize one thought, one's thoughts about global domination based on control of a, a small, small geographic location to a much larger geographic location to a still to a larger geographic location still until you control the, the entire world. Alfred Thayer Mann and Sea Power. Uh, Alfred Mann, who lived between 1840 and 1914, believed in the primacy of naval power over land power. So here we see uh, the counterpart, the, the opposite, the antagonist of uh, McKinder's theory. Mann says that naval power is supreme over land power and not the other way around, as McKinder asserted. His most important books are The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, which was published in 1890, and The Influence of Sea Power Upon the French Revolution and Empire, which was published in 1892. On the eve of World War I, the German Empire used his theories to challenge British naval dominance, and a number of historians and political scientists believe that that was in fact the primary cause of World War I. It was really German aggression uh, and German desire to challenge Great Britain at sea that led to World War I, and that uh, the uh, quarrel between the Austrian Empire and Serbia was just a sideshow and never would have escalated beyond anything other than a local or regional conflict because it was German readiness to support Austria on land against Serbia and Russia, which actually escalated the conflict into World War I. And the reason why Germany was so aggressive was because it was ready to challenge Britain for world primacy. And to challenge Britain, Britain, for, Britain for world primacy meant uh, first and foremost being able to challenge uh, British naval dominance. Karl Haushofer and German-Japanese alliance. Haushofer, who lived between 1869 and 1840, 1946, uh, was a German military officer. He was influenced by Ratzel, Jelen, the Heartland theory of Mackinder, his first-hand study of Japan, and his service in World War I. Haushofer retired from the military after World War I with the rank of Major General. His influence in the German military circles remained significant post his retirement. He was greatly affected by the German loss and in World War I, I mean, and connected it to fighting a major war on two fronts, which is the most logical common sense conclusion. To prevent another similar disaster, Haushofer argued that Germany needed to ally itself with the Soviet Union. Very interesting, because for a while, between 1939 and 1941, this uh, is pretty much what happened. Uh, Germany and the Soviet Union allied against Poland. Uh, Germany invaded Poland on September 1st from uh, the West, and then the Soviet Union 
on September 17th, 1939, invaded it from the east, and Poland thus was carved up and ceased to exist. And uh, the German uh, Soviet non aggression pact lasted uh, for two years uh, when Germany finally broke it in June of 1941. Now, around 1920, Haushofer met Jan Rudolf Hess. Later, Hess would become Hitler's deputy Fuhrer and prote protector of Haushofer's wife and son. Um, Hitler made a non aggression treaty with the Soviet Union, as I just mentioned. Um, but uh, having broken that treaty in June of 1941 and having escalated the Second World War into a conflagration never before seen and a kind of murder fest never before seen uh, really in recorded human history, um, Hitler uh, put Germany on the road of total demise and occupation and being carved up. Uh, in the dying days of the Second World War, Haushofer's son was executed by Gestapo, and that happened in April of 1945. Haushofer was psychologically unable to cope with this fact and committed suicide in 1946. World War II and geopolitics. So, uh, so far we have talked about what happened on the European continent uh, during the Second World War, but what was happening in Asia? Japan attacked China in 1937. Japan wanted colonies for natural resources, especially oil and rubber. And you can see that the idea of the country or the empire as a living entity very much fits into the pattern of aggression uh, in, in the Pacific as well. Uh, in, in order to live, uh, and prosper, Japan needed more natural resources, and chief among those was, of course, oil. So it was trying to create for itself um, an empire, an area of dominance uh, over uh, most of East Asia. Now, in the, in the meantime, Germany peacefully annexed Austria and Sudetenland in Europe in 1938. Uh, Hitler's autobiography argued for a British-German alliance, and here I, I'm referring to Mein Kampf, uh, written while Hitler, Hitler was in prison in the mid-1920s. Uh, but this proved to be impossible because uh, the British simply would not accept Ger Germany having control of the entire European continent. The British thinking remained very much its traditional uh, thinking, whereby Britain saw itself as a balancer of, of political power in terms of the European continent. So while Britain is off of the continent, the continental powers struggling for dominance over the entire continent would never be able to succeed because Britain would throw its weight behind the power or the alliance of powers that were weaker to prevent the stronger power or the stronger alliance from dominating the, the entire continent. And no matter Hitler's and his deputy Führer's Hess's fantasies about the British support, Britain would not budge on its traditional geopolitical perspective. Um, so the non-aggression uh, treaty with the Soviet Union made in 1939 was broken in 1941. And uh, this, as I said, uh, sealed the, the fate uh, of uh, eventually of World War II. And on December 7th of 1941, Japan attacked U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor, uh, which escalated World War II uh, into a truly, truly global war. Uh, George Cannon and containment, Eisenhower's uh, and the domino theory. So following the Second World War and the victory of the Allies in the Soviet Union, over the uh, Axis powers, meaning Germany, Italy, and Japan, you had the era of new geopolitics. And in that era, uh, you had two great powers known as the superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. And in order to contain the Soviet Union, uh, the X article written by uh, George Cannon counseled uh, American foreign policy on how to proceed. Uh, George Cannon said that the Soviet Union had a government which was possessed by ideological rigidity. And uh, because of this, Cannon believed that the Soviets 
would try to expand their influence in Western Europe and globally until they would achieve the global victory of communism. So to stop that, Cannon uh, counseled the containment of Soviet expansion. Dwight Eisenhower was the first one to use the term the domino theory, which postulated that if one East Asian country falls to communism, so will the rest. So if Cannon focused on Europe, then Eisenhower focused on Asia. And uh, you can see how e eventually from this idea, uh, we have escalated into an actual involvement, military involvement um, in Vietnam under Kennedy, direct military involvement where Kennedy sent special forces to a full scale war uh, under Lyndon Johnson starting in uh, 1964. The idea was to contain uh, the spread of communism in Vietnam, to limit communism to North Vietnam, because if South Vietnam fell, then after that, other East Asian, Southeast Asian countries would fall to communism. That's the essence of the domino theory. Now, post-Cold War, War developments. Henry Kissinger argued in his book, Diplomacy, that there's a danger of Russian-German alliance leading to the domination of Eurasia and the world island. Now, so far in this presentation, I have refrained from uh, my own comments or my own analysis. And I simply presented ideas as they were stated by others. Uh, I think here I'll make an ex a little bit of an exception to that uh, and uh, point out that this idea is probably far-fetched. While it might have seemed reasonable uh, in the early to mid nineties when Kissinger was working on his book uh, by the 2020s, it became evident that uh, th there is no and, uh, Russian German alliance, and likely uh, you won't you won't get one because these countries are simply too different in pursuing different goals, and uh, Germany under Merkel and Russia under Putin, um, you know, proved to be very. Uh, different countries with different interests. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who passed away relatively recently in 2017, lived a long life of almost 90 years. Uh, he was um, national security advisor under the Carter administration. And his daughter, Mika Brzezinski, became a famous uh, political commentator uh, on MSNBC with Joe Scarborough. So Brzezinski, in his uh, work on uh, modern geopolitics, said that Eurasia is thus the chessboard on which the struggle for global primacy continues to be played. And that struggle involves geostrategy, the strategic management of geopolitical interests. Now, here we can pause because this is very much an adaptation of uh, Mackinder's idea of... Uh, the uh, Eurasian heartlands to the modern world. Um, so Brzezinski does not give up the emphasis on control of territory, the importance of land power, and the importance of Eurasia as the key to future domination of the world. Um, what can I say about this? Uh, and this comes from the Grand Chessboard, which is a book written more than 20 years ago now. Uh, I, I would say that even in its time, uh, by the end of the 20th century, this idea was a bit dated. And uh, that's because of the rise of global air power, not just long range bombers, but intercontinental ballistic missiles, um, high area altitude reconnaissance, the satellites, the slow development of space uh, forces. So I would have to say that um, Zbigniew Brzezinski is a bit too much of a traditionalist in his emphasis on uh, land power and on his geographical focus on Eurasia specifically. Project for the New American Century was a very interesting development, which is uh, underreported, I think, for political reasons. 
uh, project for the New American Century founded uh, in 1997 by Bill Crystal and Robert Kagan. And originally it included approximately 25 members, including Richard Pearl, Paul Wolfowitz, James Woolsey, Elliot Abr Abrams, Donald Ramsfeld, Robert Zollick, and John Bolton. Uh, Paul Wolfowitz was probably uh, the driving intellectual force behind it. Wolfowitz was a mathematically trained political scientist, graduate of the University of Chicago. And uh, the idea was uh, the emphasis on the domination of Rimland, especially countries of the Middle East. But this was to go much further. The idea was to transform Middle East, starting with Iraq, into a democratic region. And from there, it was believed that everything would be a democracy. If Middle East could be a democracy, then uh, pretty much everything else would, would also be democracy. I mean, most of the countries outside the Middle East and, and Africa were already democratic by the late 1990s. And the um, uh, project for the new American century also asserted the need for US global hegemony. And it believed that you could combine these two goals, democratization of the Middle East and the world with the US hegemony, uh, meaning hegemony, meaning dominance, global dominance. How? How would you combine these two goals? Well, because it was the US, after all, that would be transforming Middle East politically by invading it militarily. So you invade Iraq and the whole idea of shock and awe was not so much a military tactical idea that you take your enemy by uh, surprise and you shock the enemy with all your firepower, but rather you invade Iraq, you overthrow its regime, Iraq becomes democratic, Americans agree to as liberators, and this creates shock in neighboring countries, i.e. Syria and Iran, and the people in those countries rise up, overthrow their despotic governments and install a democracy, and you have a democratic love fest in the region. Uh, this may sound, in retrospect, this may sound uh, slightly crazy, but at the time, um, you could convince yourself of that. I never convinced myself of that, and for this reason, I always opposed the war in Iraq, because I, I knew that uh, it was motivated by these idealistic considerations, that it was not a war for oil, it was not a war for terrorism. Saddam Hussein persecuted Islamic fundamentalist terrorists, he was their enemy. Uh, and this was really an attempt to transform the region by first transforming Iraq and by transforming the region, uh, asserting U.S. global dominance. Um, and the PNAC went, went further and said, well, the United States also needs to control the Internet and outer space. So it, it's kind of an interesting idea. And it's not just domination for the sake of domination by one country. But the uh, project for the new American century saw the United States as being especially good, especially benign, and the only uh, country capable of providing global stability. Uh, by, by this, I mean global political stability. And global political stability would lead to global economic stability, which would lead to global prosperity. So the idea here is if you have one single dominant power, it can maintain peace. And peace means more trade and more flows of labor and money where labor and money are needed. And this lifts all boats. Economically speaking, uh, you have unprecedented prosperity. So this is kind of the idea of Pax Americana, the uh, reincarnation of previous long periods of peace, like Pax Romana, peace under Roman Empire, or Pax Britannica, peace under the British Empire. Uh, so... Uh, an interesting idea, but some ideas when you implement them in the real world kind of turn against you. And this is uh, the presentation on geopolitics. Thanks very much.